Would you stand please for the reading of the word? The first passage is going to come from uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4. By faith, Abel offered God a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as a righteous man when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, he still speaks even though he is dead. Now I'm going to go over to the, to the book of Genesis, chapter 4. Verses 3 through 5. In the course of time, God brought, in the course of time, Gain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. But Abel brought the fat portion from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked at, the Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain, and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was angry, and his face was downcast. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Well, good morning. Good morning. It's good to be with you all here. My name is Ryan, for those of you that I may not know. In addition to working at the church over the last 10 years, I got the opportunity to coach high school soccer, coached over 200 athletes. And I remember there was one of my soccer players named Andrews, one of the best players that I ever got the chance to coach. I, I coached the freshman team at Whitney High School on Rockland. And so, you know, you get a little bit of the leftovers of varsity and JV. The best players tend to move on. Um, I, I got lucky with Andrew because he was hurt during the week of tryouts, and so he wasn't able to try out properly, and so we knew he was talented enough to make the team, but didn't know which team he should be on, so he was on my team. About three games in, realized, yeah, he should not be playing for me. He should be playing for JV at the very least. And I told the JV coach, I said, hey, this kid's super talented. If you want to come and take him, come and get him. And he said, you know, what? I've already built my team, I want to build trust with my team, and so uh, you can keep him. I said, praise God. Um, and, <laughs> and so he played for me for the year. Uh, he ended up going straight from the freshman team to the varsity team the next year, started three years of varsity, and then that was it for his soccer career. And really, by the time even he was a senior, he had gotten passed by some of the other players that were on the team. And look at, you know, I've had other players who weren't as good and ended up going on to play in college and different things. And, and so the question is, why didn't he make it to that next level? Why didn't he achieve the greatness at varsity that some of the other players achieved? And the answer is because he didn't care. He, he didn't want to. He really was only playing soccer because his mom made him. And so he was doing it as a favor to his mom, uh, but he did not care about going to the, the next level. He didn't care about being the best player. It just wasn't something that was a deep desire of his heart. And so when he came out to, to practice, to games, I mean, he'd give his best, but he was not going to do the extra work that was required to take his skill and his potential to the next level. Now, as a soccer coach, there's a little bit of frustration there of like, come on, like, you can actually do this that other guys can't do, and he didn't want to have it. But at the end of the day, it's soccer. It doesn't matter that much. He's living a great life. I talked to him last year. Um, he, he's a great person, and, and he's doing things that make him happy and that he actually enjoys and is pouring his heart into. But as Christians, we do this with God all the time where we show up as followers of Christ and we go through the motions of being a follower of Jesus and we show up to church and we think that this is enough, but we're never willing to give all of ourselves to him. We stand with one foot in and one foot out the door, waiting to see if things get too hard, waiting to see if God's call is a little bit too challenging, waiting to see if there's something better. And when there is, we turn and we run the opposite direction. And what God calls us to is complete 100% surrender of ourselves to him. And so the question I want you to ask yourself today is are you all in? Because churches are filled with people who have been attending for many years but have never really given themselves to God. They like some of the morality, they like some of the people, but they haven't been willing to commit. And so today I want you to ask, am I all in or not? Because if not, let today be the day where we stop wasting our lives and start putting ourselves fully in submission to God and say, I am all yours. It won't be easy. 
This is a great act of faith. And this is what we're talking about in our series, Big God, that we kicked off last week. How do we build big faith in a big God? So the series outline follows, well, it follows Hebrews 11, but it, it was uh, given through a book written by a pastor named Britt Merrick called Big God. And so uh, a great book that I have loved in my life and has, has helped strengthen my faith and just thought that we could walk through these faith stories and see our faith increase as well. Because the Bible is filled with people who put their trust in God, got things right, And their accounts are written in scripture for us to learn from and to grow from their account so that we can build our faith as well. There's also stories in scripture of people who didn't trust God, who put their faith in something else. And we see their failures and learn from their failures and try and grow from their failures. So you go back to the very beginning in Genesis, Adam and Eve, they had a moment of failure. They had a big moment of failure. They had this perfect relationship with God and with one another and and perfect relationship with creation and everything was going well. And Satan came along in the form of a serpent and he asked them, he said, did God really say? And so just planted this seed of doubt. Do you know God's word? Do you trust his word? Do you trust him? Is he trustworthy? Can you actually listen to what he has said? And then he got them to look at the tree and look at the fruit and said, look at how wonderful it looks and how shiny it is and pretty it is and pay attention to your stomach and you want that. And also, this fruit actually is going to give you knowledge. It's gonna make you wise. It's gonna make you like God. You're gonna have some of his power. And so instead of trusting God and his commands and his plan, instead of trusting what he had for them, they begin to trust in their stomach. They begin to trust in their eyes. They begin to trust in their heart that said, I want this. And so they took and they ate and sin entered into the world. Now they have some children and we're going to look at some of their children's story today and we're going to see the faith that was demonstrated from one and the lack of faith from another. Hebrews chapter 11, it mentions these two brothers, Cain and Abel, in verse 4. It says, by faith Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings And by faith, Abel still speaks, even though he is dead. Now that's a lot of compliments for one person. He's commended as righteous. His offering is what led him him to being commended as righteous. He still speaks, even though he is dead. There's this lifting up of Abel in his story. And so we should look and say, well, there's something here that I can learn from, that I can grow from. What was this great act of faith that he had? What did he do? Well, what he did is he worshiped God. He worshiped God. Now, maybe not in the way you're thinking. So often we we get in our minds, and as much as we try and teach out of this and, and, and teach ourselves out of this, we get in this mentality that worship happens in this building on Sunday mornings. Worship is what we do together on Sunday mornings. And this is certainly worship. This is a worship service. It should be worshipful. But this is not all that worship is. Worship, by definition, means to give worth to something. And so when we talk about what we worship, we're talking about what is our highest priority in life? What do we give the most worth, the most value to in our life? That is the thing or the person that we worship. And so who we worship matters. Worship is a central part of the Christian faith. In the Westminster Shorter Catechism, question one, it says, what's the chief end of man? So the chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. That's worship. We glorify him because he is the greatest priority in the world, in the universe, in our lives. And we enjoy him because he is the greatest priority in our life. That of all the things that we can enjoy, we're going to enjoy our time and our presence with God. That's worship. Now I'm grateful that Ned read, we both are reading out of the NIV today, but the NIV, um, several years ago, they, they did an update. And there's certain parts of the new NIV that I wish had stayed like the old NIV. So Ned was actually reading from the older NIV. And, and there's a word in there that most of the English translations of the Bible use that the new NIV has changed. And so in the new NIV, you would see that it tells us that Abel brought God a better offering. And in the old NIV, it says that he brought God a better sacrifice. And I think the word sacrifice there is a better word to use to help us understand what really is going on. 
Because sacrifice means that you give something up for something that is worth more. So we sacrifice all the time. We sacrifice things for other things all the time. If you go out to lunch today, you are going to sacrifice money to buy the food that you are going to eat. Sacrifice doesn't always have to feel bad. I have, I have, I have kids, I love my time with my kids, and when I spend time with my kids, I'm sacrificing time that I could be spending doing something else. And I tell you this not to say that spending time with my kids is miserable. I love my time with my kids. It doesn't feel like a sacrifice, but there is a giving up of something else to take that time. You sacrificed a lot of things to be here at church today because you're saying this is important and this matters. And so sacrifice is an important part of our worship. It's giving up something that has lesser value to show something that has more value that that's worth more to us. Now, we are all worshipers. We all make sacrifices. We are all worshipers. The question is who you worship and how you worship. Who you worship, like we talked about last week, our faith needs to be in God. It needs to be in Christ. It's all about him. It's all about him. It's all about him. We come to worship God. And how we worship is not about the style of music or or, or the style of the preaching or different things like that. The how we worship is a heart check. What are our hearts doing? Our hearts committed to God. And so when we look at Abel's story and we say, well, what made Abel's sacrifice better than Cain's? It's really about the heart. Go to Genesis chapter 4. And it gives us the background on this story of these two brothers. And so it tells us in verse 3 that in the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering. But on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. We take the text and we look and we say, well, what is different about Cain and Abel's offering? Well, Cain brought fruit. Abel brought meat. So maybe God is just up in heaven being like, meat, good, fruit, bad. Not what happened, it's not what's happening. Vegans, we still love you. (laughs) What's happening, the word that we want to pay attention to is firstborn. Abel brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn. It doesn't tell us that of Cain. He brought some of the fruit, but he didn't bring the first. It's not the first fruits, he brought some. Of the leftovers, some of the crop, it doesn't matter what, what part he gave. His heart was not about giving the first, it was about giving some. And we actually know that Cain's heart was far from God in this moment. Because when God says, hey, the offering, it's not pleasing, instead of trying to figure out, well, what did I do? What can I do that is pleasing? How can I please? Because that's what I want to do. Cain gets angry and he kills his brother. Because it was all about him. Now, many of us have, have grown up in church or, or have heard these stories over the years and we're familiar with the story of Cain and Abel. And so it's easy to look and say, yeah, Cain's offering was bad because he didn't give the first and Abel gave the first and that's what's important, so we should give the first. But let's give Cain a little bit of credit. Before the whole murder piece, what he did with his offering kind of makes sense. I mean, you think about it, it's a very logical human thing to do. To look in both of them and say, hey, let's bring an offering to God. All right, sounds good. And so Cain goes and he starts taking the fruit and he says, okay, well, here's what I need for this week and here's what I need for this month and here's what will provide me seed for the next crop and so that'll take care of that and, and I'm gonna put some aside for retirement and I'm gonna put some aside for my kid's college fund and I'm gonna put some aside for a rainy day and some aside for vacation and, and I'm gonna do all these things to make sure that everything's taken care of and then after I've gone through the whole budget, I'm gonna look and I'm gonna see, yes, there's still some left over and I'll bring that before God. It's a very logical thing to do but it's not the right thing to do. Abel, meanwhile, looked and he said, all right, well, there's the first born of of the first flock. Let's grab this one and let's take that. And I'm sure Cain looked at him and said, you're gonna give the very first? What if the rest of your flock gets a disease? What if they're eaten by animals? What if that's the only one left? You, You need the firstborn to make sure that you can produce another flock and another flock and another flock. You don't know what's gonna happen. 
And this is why Abel's actions were an action of worship. It was an action of trust. It was an action of faith. It was a true sacrifice. Abel gave the first and Cain gave the leftovers. And in our lives, when we give ourselves to God, we need to give the first, the best of what we have. As a matter of fact, I'll give you three reasons why we need to give God the first. And we see this in Cain and Abel's story. And the first is this, is that giving God the first shows that he is the priority. Giving God the first shows that he is the priority. When you look at your week, you go into the office tomorrow, you go into work tomorrow, you probably have a, a task list. And we got a really long task list of things to do this week. Maybe not just in work, but at home and different things. A lot of you don't have long task lists. Listen, come to my house after church and I'll set you up with a few things to do. Um, but, but we have long task lists. We look, we want to take that task list and say, okay, I do not have time to get everything done. Or maybe I think I can get everything done, but what we're going to do is we're going to prioritize. We're going to start figuring out which things are the most important things that I absolutely have to get done, which things can maybe put off to the side. And the things that are the priorities that we have to get done first, we're going to do them first. It's a matter of priorities. If you've ever watched the Super Bowl or many big sporting events, after the game is done and they have the MVP, the MVP gets on a commercial. And in the commercial, someone says, you just won the Super Bowl. What are you going to do next? And what do they say? I'm going to Disneyland or Disney World if you're closer. But I'm definitely going to do something Disney. Why? Well, Disney pays these people. So that's the main reason. But they, Disney does this because they want people to, to look and to see, wow, the winner of the Super Bowl wants to go to Disneyland. And us common chumps, we think, well, then we need to do the same thing. <laughs> if he just achieved the, the, the greatest achievement in his career path, one of the greatest moments of, of this person's life, one of the greatest moments of, their, of success, they want to go to Disneyland? That's the first thought on their mind? Then what does that do to the rest of us? We start thinking, well, when I graduate college, I need to go to Disneyland. When I get married, I need to go to Disneyland. When I get a raise, I need to go to Disneyland. When I've just been at Disneyland, I need to celebrate by going to back to Disneyland. <laughs> That's my mentality in life. And so it's this idea that this is the priority. This means more than everything else because it's first. If six months down the road you said, hey, you won an MVP six months ago um, and you just went to Disneyland, that wouldn't mean anything to us. No, it's because it's first, it's the priority. Second thing, giving God the first uh, shows that we trust him for the rest. It shows that we trust him for the rest. Again, you go to Cain and Abel's story. Cain is thinking, I gotta make sure everything is set aside and taken care of because I gotta do all the work to take care of myself and then what's left over I can give to God. That's a nice sentiment, right? Like we like it if someone's like, hey, I, I took these cookies to an event and most of them got used, but there's some leftovers. Do you want them? If they're good, you're like, yeah, that's great. Thank you. But it's not giving the first. Giving God the first says that we trust God for the rest. That we recognize things can happen in life. The world's a crazy place. I can lose my job. I can get sick. Disease can happen. Famine can happen. Depressions can happen. And so when we look at the first, we're saying, yeah, I need this to be protected, to be guarded from what the future holds. But when we give it to God, we're saying, I'm trusting you for the rest. I'm trusting you to be the provider. I'm trusting you with my life. The third reason that we give God the first is that it shows that we are different. It shows that we are different than the rest of the world. And so many people want to conform. They want to be just like everybody else, but we need to be a light. We are called the salt of the earth, the light of the world. Things that stand out. We live differently because we have a different hope. We've experienced a different love. We know we have eternity and we want people to know how they can get to eternal life with God. And so we live differently to demonstrate the hope that we have, the truth that we know, so that others can hear and receive that as well. And so we need to live differently. Romans chapter 12 actually calls us to this. Chapter 12, verse 2 says, do not conform to the pattern of this world. I'm going to back up to verse 1. 
and give a little context. It says, therefore, now free Bible study technique here. If you ever see a therefore in scripture, you should find out what the therefore is there for. So at this point, if, if you just open up your Bible, happen to turn to Romans 12, 1 and read therefore, really what it's telling you is you need to read the rest of the 11 chapters of Romans. Because what Romans does is it walks through this idea in the first few chapters, it basically says, hey, all people have sinned. And then it gets, starts getting into this place of talking about, and the way to salvation is through God's grace. It's through putting your trust in Christ. And so Romans, the first 10 chapters, or, or 11 chapters, sorry, are all about salvation through Christ alone. Faith alone in Christ alone is how we are saved. That apart from him, we are destined for death and destruction, but with him, we receive life. Life eternally, life to the full. And so it's saying because of that, because of who God is and what he has done, this is what it is saying. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, again, the previous 11 chapters, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. I don't know about you, but I want to please God. When I stand before him in eternity, I hope that he says, well done, good and faithful servant. And so Romans 12, 2 says that if you want to please God, that you need to stop trying to conform to the ways of this world, but allow your mind to be renewed by refocusing on who Jesus is over and over and over again. In the song we just sang a little bit ago that I had mentioned last week, it says, I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made it when it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm coming back to the heart of worship where it's all about you. It's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. It's all about you. It's all about you. And we need to keep bringing our minds, our hearts, our souls, every part of ourselves back to that truth because it's so easy to go astray. It's so easy to fall off the track. And so we renew our mind over and over and over again saying it's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Not giving in to the ways of this world and saying it's about anything else. It's all about him. And the way that we do this is mentioned in Romans 12.1. That we give all of ourselves to God. We give ourselves as a living sacrifice. We give ourselves in worship. It's not just about money. It's not just about a song. It's not just about words. It's about giving ourselves, our hearts, truly and fully over to him. And we do this by being reminded of God's mercy in view of God's mercy, we offer ourselves as a living sacrifice. And because we've given ourselves to God, we're not gonna conform to the ways of this world and be like everybody else, but instead we're gonna continue to be reminded that it's all about Jesus and we're gonna live fully and completely sold out for him. So three things that we need to give to God. The first thing that we need to give is Starbucks cards to your pastor. Number one, give God your time. Give God your time. We have a limited amount of time and the amount of, of time that we have, we should be using all of it to glorify God. And so this means different things for different people. One of the ways that I know I give God my time is in the morning, I start my morning off with a Bible reading plan. It takes like 15, 20 minutes a day. It's not a huge sacrifice. But it's saying I want to give God the first part of my day. Now, Martin Luther, he actually is quoted saying that I'm too busy to not spend the first three hours of every day in prayer. I haven't gotten to that level of trust yet. But maybe that's what we need. Do you spend time in prayer? Do you spend time in your word? And also, as you go about your business throughout your days, you're doing different things with your time. Are you using those things to glorify God or not? Because it's not just about setting time aside, it's about using all of our time to glorify God. In every moment of the day, we can give him praise, we can give him worship, we can be in prayer, we can be a light for him. Second thing that we need to give is give God your talent. Every single one of you has talent. Every single one of you is gifted. 
Every single one of you has been uniquely equipped and designed by God for a certain purpose. And the question is, will you give your talent to God? Now, oftentimes we think that the only way to do this is serving on a Sunday morning. And that's a great way of utilizing your talent. Like, I'm so grateful to the band and our, and our, and our singers for leading us in worship each and every week. That is a way that they are using their talents to glorify God. But it's not the only one. At the school that I've been able to coach at, our varsity coach, he's one of the teachers at the school. He is an incredibly godly man. And he has a gift for teaching, a gift for coaching that honestly he could use to make a lot of money in certain places. But he uses that to teach and to coach kids. And although he's doing it in a public school system, he is being a light for Jesus Christ by giving his talents over and saying, hey, yes, I'm doing this for the glory of God. And so there's certain rules he has to follow. But I'm telling you, the witness is evident. So whatever you do, use your time, use your talent for God's glory. And the final thing is give God your treasure. Give God your treasure. Now, the, the timing of things today was not planned by people. I believe it was planned by God. Um, but I will say the fact that we happen to have a budget update today, and I'm saying give God your treasure, these two things were disconnected. So if you're just like, okay, all today is about, is bu about budget, that was not intentionally planned. I think it was intentionally planned by God, but hey, here's where we're at. But here's the thing, this is not about money. It's not about time, it's not about talent, it's about our hearts. It's about what has been given to us and connecting our hearts to God. It's about giving all of ourselves to him. And so we want to give our treasure to God. It's one of the things that tries to pull our hearts away more than anything else how we use our finances. And there's so many different ways that, that we can go and spend our money. We can spend our money on all types of things. But are you glorifying God with your finances? By the way, this is not just about giving to the church. Tithe is that 10% supposed to go to the church. The offerings can be to anything and it kind of goes above and beyond that. And if you're like, I can't start with 10%, start with something. But it's not just about giving your treasure to the church. How many people own a home in here? Own a house? Okay, you've spent money on your house. That's part of your treasure. Can you use your house to glorify God? Can you open up that space to show hospitality? Can you use it to welcome someone in who needs to be welcomed in? You own a car? How many people own a car? You can use that as a resource to glorify God. Maybe it's just taking a friend to the airport, helping somebody move because you got a truck. And if you have a truck, you're going to help people move. That's why I got rid of my truck. I was tired of helping people. I miss my truck. <sighs> Thank you. Um, but use your treasure to glorify God. Your time, your treasure, your talent, all these things are, are part of who you are. And if we're giving the best and we're giving the first to God, then we're offering all of these things at the altar before him saying you're the priority, we're trusting you with the rest. And yes, we're gonna be different, we're gonna use our things differently than the rest of the world, but we're doing that to glorify God, to be a light to the world, to move some mountains in people's hearts. Like the way you give of yourself can move mountains in people's hearts. When people see you using your time, your treasure, and your talent differently than the rest of the world, it's gonna move mountains. And there's so many different ways I could spend the next hour talking about this. There's so many different ways we can do this. You get a nice bonus check and you use that to serve somebody. You reach out and say, hey, I know you're going through a hard time and I just want to bless you and, and we got this bonus check and we want to help you in, in, in this difficult time. That speaks volumes. Parents, are you using your time, your treasure, your talent to disciple your kids towards Christ or to try and get them a college scholarship? What we do with our time, our treasure, and our talent says where our hearts are at. Is your heart fully committed to God? That's the question you need to ask. These things can help you evaluate. But it's not about these things in a box. God doesn't care just about your time, your talent, your treasure. He cares about you. He wants you. He wants a relationship with you. And we just want to give our hearts and connect our hearts to God. Proverbs chapter 3 reminds us of who God is. 
And it tells us in verses nine and 10, it says, honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. And so what this tells us is that we can't outgive God. What this tells us is that he is the provider. What it reminds us of is that he has already given significantly more than we will ever give back to him. Now, I, I, I don't want you to hear that if you give a little, you're gonna become a millionaire. Because this scripture can be a little bit, um, a, a little bit challenging with that, it can be used in the wrong way. What really this whole proverb, Proverbs 3, is telling us is that when we commit ourselves to God, God is gonna meet us where we're at. When we give ourselves in relationship over to him, he's gonna meet us in that space. And it's saying what he wants is our heart. And whatever is holding us back from giving our hearts and ourselves completely to him, it's trying to remind us that God is worth more than all of that. A relationship with Christ is worth more than all the money in the world. It's not always gonna feel like that. But he's so much more valuable. And so it's saying give yourselves to God because God's already given himself to you. And so I wanna wrap up with this story from my own life. And I think I've shared it before, but I only have so many, so deal with it. Um, <laughs> I struggled with tithing for a long time in my life. This idea of giving your treasure was really challenging. Giving time was fine. Giving talent was fine. That was easy. Giving treasure was, was, that was the hard part for me. And so when my wife and I, we first got married about 14 years ago, um, we brought a lot of debt into our marriage. Thank you, Christian colleges. They're great, and, and, and I appreciate them. But we also didn't have the best financial tools in, in our belt. And, and so we brought a lot of debt into our, our marriage and our relationship, and I worked at a church, and she worked at a nonprofit, so we didn't make a lot of money either. And because of that, we looked at our budget, and we just weren't, we were barely paying all of our bills month to month. And so even though we felt like tithing was a good thing, it felt like it was something that was bonus. And, and so I convinced myself that, God, we're already giving you our time and our talent in big ways, so you don't need our treasure. By the way, just to be clear, he did not need our treasure, but he wanted us. And so there came a time where, where we were just feeling God's spirit leading us to say, hey, you know what, we really need to start tithing, and, and we just need to write that check and, and just go with it. And so we made it so that it came out automatically of our um, of our paycheck so that it was set and done. That way there was no backing out. And we said, God, this is, this is yours and we're gonna trust you with the rest because right now our bills show that we are now going to go into more debt each and every month, which I don't think honors God either. And I'm just telling you, this is my story. It's not all of yours. This is my story and how God moved in my heart. But within one or two weeks of, of committing that money and setting that aside and making sure that that came out automatically, I was called into my boss's office and I got an unexpected raise that gave me enough to raise our 10%, so it still stayed with 10% of our income and pay all of our bills. Yeah, praise God. Now, don't hear me saying that if you start tithing, you're gonna get a raise in the next two weeks, okay? <laughs> Not what I'm saying. But what I want to tell you is that this is how I experienced Proverbs 3 that we were holding something back from God. And he said, Ryan, you can't outgive me. And so when we gave, we experienced a physical blessing that led to a spiritual blessing of heart transformation. Now I'll tell you that over the years of tithing and giving faithfully, because that's never been an issue since then, however, there have been some hard financial times. There have been some months where we're looking and we're saying our bills are just not lining up and we cut in other places, but our hearts were transformed in that moment and it was about God meeting us and saying, hey, I am all you need. I am enough. I am sufficient. Do you trust me or not? Do you trust me completely because you're holding part of yourself back? And so I wanna challenge you to give all of yourself to God. Is there an area of your life Maybe it's not your time, your treasure, your talent. Maybe it's your identity. Maybe it's your relationships. Maybe it's your job. Is there an area of your life that you have not submitted to him? If so, let today be the day 
where you say, God, I'm all yours. And just watch and see what he's gonna do. Faith the size of a mustard seed placed in Christ can move mountains. Maybe you need a mountain moved in your heart today. Trust God with a little and see how he'll give you a lot. Be all in, fully committed followers of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I give you thanks again for your word that leads and guides us, that just speaks to our hearts, to our souls, to our minds. God, I pray for the people in this room who have been living in relationship with you with one foot in and one foot out. God, I pray that today you would get a hold of their hearts, that you would show them your goodness, your love, your mercy, that you would help them to trust you. God, as they demonstrate trust and live out their faith in whatever area that looks like, whatever call you have on their hearts, that you would meet them in their faithfulness. We know that you are faithful. But let us feel your faithfulness. Let us see your faithfulness so that we can know it, trust it, and be faithful to you. God, thank you for all that you've given to us. You loved us so deeply that you gave your only son. We can never repay that. But God, we wanna give ourselves to you as an act of worship, as an act of faith, an act of trust, because you are worthy of it all. We love you and praise things in Jesus' name, amen.